this lecture we're going to discuss the science of classification and we're going to apply the principles of the science in relationship to microbiology. Uh, to begin the discussion, we're going to look at uh, the science of taxonomy or how to classify organisms. And the picture that I have here is actually one of Noah's Ark, and it's meant to represent the beginning parts of the um, science of taxonomy when uh, scientists could only see things with their naked eyes in relationship to determining how animals and plants are related to one another. So in today's uh, lecture, we're going to discuss the early principles, and then we're going to talk about how those principles have changed as technology has improved. So in terms of taxonomy, really it's the science of classifying organisms, and it's a particular way of describing organisms that is used uh, universally by all countries. Also, it provides a reference point for identifying organisms and also determining how organisms are related to one another. There's a particular way of describing a particular species, and that's naming it according to both the genus and the species. So most, uh, there are several ways to do that. The most common way is to have the first genus name be capitalized, the second name be small case or lower case, and then the whole name uh, italicized. It can also, however, be uh, written uh, with an underline, and that is often done uh, as well. So there are two different ways of uh, classifying organisms in relationship uh, to their genus and species name. So phylogeny is the science of determining the relatedness of organisms and how they differ from one another. So in terms of describing these relationships, it's actually done a lot like uh, constructing a family tree. So you can see the uh, diagram down here. The bottom part or the root of this so-called tree of life is actually the ancestor. And then everything above the ancestor are uh, the descendants of the ancestor. And so as we go up the tree, we go from ancestry uh, to descendants, and then we also uh, progress in time in, from past to most recent. Uh, systemics uh, is also classified, is also a way of classifying species by using the term clade. And the term clade is actually all of the uh, subsequent descendants that come from the common ancestor. So uh, to describe a clade, basically you would describe the ancestor as well as all of the descendants. So in the upper uh, figures here, we actually have the clades, and below is examples where uh, they are not clades. So also, in relationship to the way that you describe relatedness, you have the common ancestor. So you can have a common ancestor of several different branches, and you can also have a common ancestor of just two, and then, of course, uh, you, you can have a unique ancestor, which is just the ancestor of that particular uh, branch. So each lineage has ancestors that are unique to that lineage, and then you can have ancestors that are common to several lineages. Now, how does that all relate to microbiology? Well, believe it or not, we're going to get there. In terms of the hierarchy of taxonomy, the most that, as we discussed before, we're really going to focus on genus and species, but also we're going to look at these other classifications as well. And as the science of taxonomy has improved based on technology, these classifications have changed. And nowhere is that more true than with uh, microbiology and in microbes especially. So in terms of the history, it's always nice to look at the history in relationship to getting a better understanding of a field. So 
if you can remember in our lecture, in our first lecture, we discussed different discoveries. Well, one of the biggest discoveries in relationship to taxonomy was Loewenhoek when he uh, discovered the microscope. So really, that was in the late 1600s. So that made a huge difference in relationship to taxonomy. But even after the discovery of the microscope, it took quite some time before we actually included microbes into taxonomy. So in the beginning were the plants and the animals, and that was the level of classification back in the 1700s. And then later on, as things got developed further, remember Jenner, well Jenner, uh, he discovered the smallpox vaccine in the late 1700s. And after some time uh, subsequent to his discovery, we then were including bacteria because we could actually visualize them at that point and we can also test for them. So in the mid to late 1800s, we included now bacteria and fungi and we put them originally in the plant kingdom, not thinking that they were animals. And later in the 1800s, we actually created a new kingdom called the protos or protista, or protozoa is another way of saying it. And the protista was proposed now for bacteria, protozoa, algae, and fungi. Now, again, we didn't distinguish the cell wall, the nucleus, for a large part because we couldn't really visualize them at that point. So all the way until 1937, which uh, isn't really that long ago, uh, the prokaryotes were introduced as a new kingdom, and they were introduced to represent cells that did not have a nucleus. All the way from the 30s to the 60s, then we um, actually created a definition for prokaryotes, which was that, they, that the prokaryotes did have DNA, but they had a nucleoplasm that was not surrounded by a membrane. In 1959, then we created a separate kingdom for the fungi, and then we created a kingdom for the prokaryotes. And then finally in the 70s, uh, in the late 70s to be exact, we actually created two different kinds of prokaryotic cells, which we will discuss uh, in the next slide or two. So using these particular molecular criteria that this Carl Woosey uh, developed. He actually used, he, he was a very brilliant man to come up with this discovery because he used uh, ribosomal RNA. Now most scientists up until that point had, had rely on DNA. If they were going to uh, work molecularly, they relied on DNA. But this scientist had the brilliance of determining that actually RNA was potentially a better uh, instrument or better uh, marker for diversity and we're, we're going to discuss that in one of our questions so that we can get a better handle on why that is. But anyway, before that point where we had ribosomal RNA, we actually uh, used uh, other identifiable characteristics like morphology and cell membranes and things like that. And so the old world so-called, prior to 1977, we had the plants, the fungi, and the animalia. Uh, we had the protists and the monera, which is another word for yeast. That was how we classified things. But after Carl Woosey, we now have three domains, the archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. So presently, now this is certainly can be subject to change, but presently these are the different criteria that are used to classify all plants and animals. And as we go further into particularly the discussion of bacteria, we will rely on some of these criteria much more than others. So the important criteria for microbes, of course, is physiology, 
which system of the body does the microbe uh, live in and which uh, system of the body does the microbe invade. Uh, also the ecology of the organism. Does the organism live in particular tissues? Does the organism live in the soil, in the water, in particular animals? Is the microbe a parasite? So the ecology of the organism is very important in relationship to microbiology. The other important criteria is behavior. How does the microbe behave? Does the microbe require oxygen? Does the microbe live in environments that doesn't have oxygen? Does the microbe move? Uh, is the microbe drawn to particular chemicals? So behavior is a very important part of classification of microbes. The other important criteria, of course, is morphology. What shape is the organism? What kind of appendages does the organism have? What's the structure? What's the membrane? What's the internal organization of the organelles? And so forth. And then finally, the most important criteria is what is the molecular evidence? Now, the molecular evidence is obviously changing all the time, so it, one needs to really keep up with uh, what's going on in terms of classification of these organisms because they do change. And as we go through bacteria in particular, we'll discuss some of these technologies that are currently being used to classify. So there are three, uh, as I mentioned before, there are three domains of life. There's the eukaryotes, and then really the prokaryotes are really both the bacteria and the archaea. Some people also call it the archaea. And the archaea, archaea, is a brand new kingdom that just came along about 30 or 40 years ago, as we discussed earlier. And that kingdom is continually being redefined. So the first question in today's discussion is which domain do you suspect contains the most diversity? Well, originally it used to be thought that it was the eukaryotes. And unfortunately that is no longer the case. However, we still haven't fully figured out the, the diversity of bacteria. And most scientists actually believe that bacteria now has a greater diversity than plants and animals and uh, unicellular and multicellular organisms. However, there's, there's, uh, the jury is still out on that discussion. But then the archaea uh, could possibly uh, come in uh, second or maybe someday even first because we've only really scratched the surface of these organisms. So the second question has to do with why do you think RNA is used to classify microorganisms at this point? Well, let's really think about what RNA does. First of all, RNA is only single-stranded. Okay, remember that DNA is double-stranded. DNA is a more stable molecule. RNA is a much more variable uh, uh, molecule. It can uh, be uh, cut, uh, it can be spliced and joined together. And what we're learning about in relationship to bacteria is how rapidly they can recombine and how easily they can change and become new strains based on things like antibiotic resistance. So if you think about the ancestral tree model, for instance, and say we have a particular bacterial species, let's say bacteria number one, in the presence of antibiotics, we can have recombination of genetic material, and then we can have a strain, uh, let's call it strain A, and then a strain B, and then based on the selective pressure, the natural selection that occurs with antibiotics, we could, for instance, select for this strain B, and one of the mechanisms that can actually distinguish these two strains 
from one another very uniquely is RNA, even more so than DNA, because potentially strain A and B could have very, uh, could have DNA that's very similar or even the same, but the RNA will be potentially different because the strains are different. And so that way you can actually distinguish between the strains by using RNA. So as we go through, particularly in our discussion about bacteria, we're really going to talk about how these strains uh, develop and what are, the, some of, what are some of the criteria that promote uh, the, the development of these multiple strains. So that concludes our discussion about classification of organisms. Thank you so very much for listening to educator.com.